Hi everyone, thanks for joining. We're gonna give it a few more minutes before we start the meeting and let a, let a few more people jump on. All right, everyone, we're going to get started. Um, thank you for virtually attending this meeting. Uh, this is the kickoff meeting for Dr. Cog's Regional Complete Streets Toolkit. Let's see if I can get my slides to advance. There we go. Um, the agenda today is going to include project team introductions, a review of the vision and goals for this project plans for the scope and schedule. Um, this toolkit is essentially for Dr. Cog's local jurisdiction. So we'd like to talk about how we want stakeholders to be involved throughout the development, a complete streets overview. Um, and then we're gonna end the meeting with a group discussion that will help um, the project team gauge what wants and expectations the stakeholders have from this toolkit. Um, real quick, we'll do some project team introductions. I'm Beth Dalbo. I'm a transportation planner at Dr. Cog and will be managing, managing this project on the Dr. Cog side of things. Um, I also am the primary contact for Dr. Cog's Regional Vision Zero and other safety efforts. And I'm also our active transportation planner for the region. Um, we've selected Tool Design Group to be our primary consultant for this project. Um, we're really excited about their experience and expertise they're gonna bring to the table. Um, so with that, I'll let them do some quick introductions. Hey, good morning, everyone. My name is Trung Vo, um, and I'm the consultant project manager uh, for this project. Really looking forward to working with everyone. We would love to do uh, individual introductions, but because of the size of the group, uh, we're, we're not going to do that. But we will, will love to hear from 
um, from most, if not all of you, uh, closer to the end during our group discussion. Um, Jessica Fields will be facilitating that group discussion. She's our uh, Denver office director. And we also have Jay Rankins and um, Andy Rutz with MIG here on the call. Um, so really looking forward to, to working with you all. All right, real quick, I'm gonna talk about some of the project vision and goals. Um, this project is really meant to be a toolkit for our local governments. Um, Dr. Cog is hoping it'll be a useful resource to assist and provide guidance to plan, design, and implement complete streets. And we want this to provide strategies and support for decision makers, planners, um, people making facility design decisions to ensure multimodal elements are incorporated into regional transportation projects. Um, these are some of the general goals I want to list off real quick. Um, Trung's going to go into more detail on these when he discusses the project scope. Um, but we want this project to support connectivity and development of safe and comfortable transportation networks for all modes and users, promote the latest design criteria and guidelines for multimodal facilities, establish a vision for how local governments could adopt and apply complete street policies, um, develop a multimodal street design typography, um, develop a complete streets toolkit to create awareness and provide guidance on a variety of street design measures and provide project definition and design function guidance for project sponsors when they're applying for future funding. Um, this toolkit is also going to support a lot of other Dr. Cog plan and initiatives. Um, first off, MetroVision, which is Dr. Cog's regional comprehensive plan that dictates the work we do here at Dr. Cog. Um, it will support MetroVision's regional themes and outcomes, specifically the two themes displayed here, which are having the Dr. Cog region being a connected, connected multimodal region with um, healthy, inclusive, liv livable communities. Um, this effort will strongly support taking action on Regional Vision Zero, which was adopted by Dr. Cog's Board of Directors um, June of this year. Um, there is an action initiative in the plan that specifically spells out the development of a regional complete streets toolkit that incorporates Vision Zero principles. Um, also, when taking action on Regional Vision Zero was out for stakeholder comments, we received many comments requesting that Dr. Cog give more direction on how to reduce um, crashes listed in the crash profiles and to give more details on countermeasures listed in the plan. And that's exactly what we want this toolkit to do. Um, it's also going to support the implementation of the active transportation plan. Um, Complete Streets is mentioned throughout the plan, um, all throughout the plan, specifically in policy programs and practices that support active transportation. Um, the number of member governments with Complete Streets policy regulations and code is listed as a key performance measure to supporting the active transportation objective of improving the region's um, multimodal system, um, transportation system. And then lastly, the 2050 MVRTP is currently being updated. I know many of you are working on project proposal submittals for this plan um, right now. Um, the typo typologies we will be developing as part of the toolkit will assist in defining investment pri priorities and strategies um, that will go into the long range plan update. Um, just a few more quick things I wanna to touch on. The biggest thing we want out of this project is to give local jurisdiction more resources. Um, that's um, one of the essential things we do here at Dr. Cog. We're working towards developing more active maps, um, making more regional data sources more easily available to local jurisdictions. And we want to continue to build on that by developing um, the street typologies and um, more detailed design guidelines. Um, it's also important for doctors, local jurisdictions to be somewhat on the same page. Um, we know many local jurisdictions are at different points with complete streets implementation. And we're hoping that this is an opportunity for local jurisdictions to have cross jurisdictional collaboration on policies and de design elements of complete streets. Um, and this is my last slide before I turn over to Trung, um, but we want this toolkit to encourage complete streets design principles throughout the region um, to promote facilities that enable safe access for all users, specifically vulnerable road grade users, such as pedestrians, bicyclists, transit users um, of all ages and abilities. And with that, um, I'll turn it over to Trung. 
All right. So um, before we get too far into the presentation, um, I do want to mention that the chat box is an option to everyone. So if, if you've got a question or a comment um, that comes up, please feel free to um, to utilize the chat box. Um, and then during the, the group discussion later, um, you can you can raise your hand in response to uh, a question, and, and we'll be sure to unmute you so that you can um, you can respond to each of the questions. So um, definitely use the tools that are available to us via GoToWebinar. Um, I do want to just jump quickly into the uh, scope and schedule discussion. Um, so this is sort of just the the nuts and bolts of of the project, but I think it's important for us to understand. I'll kind of go through this first and then talk about um, this Complete Streets Steering Committee, um, what is being expected, uh, what, what we're asking of the Complete Streets Steering Committee, and then get into some Complete Streets principles. So um, the very first task for this project is to establish a, a really clear understanding of um, Complete Streets, how they benefit communities, um, how they relate to planning principles, um, and then what, what's actually being done right now um, in the region. And we're, get, we're gonna need your help uh, to establish that the inventory, and I'll touch on that later. Um, we'll, we'll be um, utilizing some, some, uh, some focused interviews with just a few member governments, um, but we'll also be uh, developing a, an online survey to send out to all the member governments um, so that we have the clearest picture possible of what's being done from a complete streets perspective uh, in the Denver region. Beth, I'm having a hard time advancing my slides. If, if you want to advance them, that's that's totally fine too. Um, going back to, um, to task two, uh, we're, we're going to uh, investigate uh, and, and, and really leverage a lot of the work that, that we've uh, done nationally to provide guidance around policy and, and project development. So how do you actually advance complete streets um, from, from the, the operational and, and sort of administrative side of things? How do you get things started? How do you incentivize complete streets? How do you make sure that complete streets design principles are integrated into to all pieces, all phases of the project development process? Um, that's what task two is gonna touch on. And, and we'll also be providing a, a model complete streets policy. There, there are complete streets policies already in, in the region, I think that, um, that are, are great examples, um, but we'll also be providing some more guidance there. So then um, for task three uh, on the next slide, uh, th this is this is really where it starts to get uh, a lot of fun. Um, we're, we're, we're setting out to develop a um, complete streets typology, um, which is to say, uh, you know, we, we wanna define um, certain street types in order to assign a complete street design treatments to each of those street types, depending on the land use context, depending on um, existing and future expectations for how the street's functioning, um, traffic volumes, traffic speeds, but also um, uh, multimodal priorities, biking, walking, and, and transit. Um, and so that's gonna be a big chunk of this project, and that's really where we're gonna need a lot of your help um, to uh, tell us what you're kind of expecting for a regional complete streets typology, how is it going to be useful to you, um, and then and then how are you looking and, and understanding your streets today, um, how are you making street design decisions for your streets today, um, and how should that re relate to a regional typology. Task four um, then attempts to, uh, Oh, yep, to the next slide, yeah. So this is just an example from um, from Ames, Iowa, just to give you a sense of, of what we're talking about, but but at a, at a regional scale. Um, on the left side, you'll see an image of um, street types that are applied uh, across the city uh, of Ames. And, and you'll see that they don't necessarily, um, they're not necessarily one-to-one -one with the traditional functional, functional classifications of arterial um, and, um, uh, major and minor collectors and, and local streets. Rather, they're a lot more sensitive to um, land use context. And then in, in addition to defining um, street types or establishing street types for, for every street, um, we're going to provide guidance for what those street types actually look like um, based on how they look today, but, but, uh, but really um, driving towards what we want them to look like in the future, how we want them to, to operate. And not just from a mobility standpoint, and I'll get into this later, but um, from, from a land use standpoint, from, a, um, from a, a, a tree cover, tree canopy standpoint, 
from landscaping to utilities. It's, it's kind of thinking about the street not only as uh, a way to get from point A to point B, uh, but, but from a perspective of, of streets being a place where you might want to be and, and linger. So task four then gets into um, the, the, the toolkit part of this project, which is um, to provide some guidance around uh, what, you know, how, how do you decide, given limited resources, limited space, limited funding, um, how, how do you decide uh, when you don't have enough space for everything? Um, how do you decide what's most important? And, and even in cases where you do have all the space, um, you may not actually want a very wide road, right? So um, so we're, the, the first piece of this is to develop a, what we're calling a right-of-way space allocation framework. Basically, it, it, it will um, help ultimately help member governments uh, make decisions around how to dedicate, how to allocate uh, right-of-way space. Um, to accomplish the goals that they have for for their communities and for their transportation networks, and then the the second piece of this, the the big piece is um, design treatment detail. So um, we're we're going to tie each design treatment to a street type, uh, having been developed in, in task three, um, and then also tie it to to context. And so on on the next slide, it just this just gives you an idea of um, of what what those two things look like. So um, the the image on on the left uh, basically just communicates based on the street type what is most important in terms of a street element should it should you know sidewalks be a high priority um, on an industrial street uh, should bike lanes be a low priority on a boulevard those those types of th things and and then on, on the right side um, when you really get to the point where you're when you've gotten to a point where where you you have determined you've decided what is important, how do you actually implement um, those those design treatments? And on the on the right side, is just an example of uh, of guidance around a neighborhood traffic circle. So then on the uh, on the next slide, task five is sort of a catch all, but it but it really just includes um, uh, coordinating with stakeholders, including you all. Um, coordinating with with the public with the the public survey and interactive map. Um, Supporting the development of the project web page, as well as um, giving presentations to uh, Dr. Cog's committees and board. And then uh, on the next slide here, we are going to um, just talk about what we're asking of of you all. So um, we're asking you to to really do three primary things, and I'll dive into much more detail for the third um, thing that we're asking of you on the next slide, but. But uh, as, as a member of the Clean Street Steering Committee, we're asking you to um, commit to contributing to developing the Regional Complete Streets Toolkit. So, so we're we're asking um, you to represent your jurisdiction or your organization. And, and if you can't, we're going to be asking um, for for you to um, find some someone to take your place uh, to contribute and review and give us feedback and input on project deliverables. Um, and then, and then the third piece on the next slide, uh, there's there's a there's a lot here, but but it's, I I think we're trying to um, we're trying to provide each activity in sort of bite-sized pieces, right? So the the very first one is is today's project kickoff. Um, thank you for joining us today. We really appreciate your time and are really excited about this effort. Um, we're we're planning to have uh, three workshops with this Complete Street Steering Committee over the course of this project, which will be um, about uh, you know 15 or 16 months or so, and so so they'll be spread out, and each each workshop will be about um, an hour and a half to, to two hours each. And the the intent is to make the best use of of your time. So we really want to be able to to leverage um, the diversity of of thoughts and opinions and perspectives and, and experience um, and expertise to be able to uh, really advance the the all of the deliverables from the scope of work. Um, after this meeting, probably in the next week and a half or so, we intend to distribute a member government online survey. And the intent is, is really to help us with inventorying um, how we're advancing Fleet Streets as a region and as localities um, today. Uh, and so we're, we're going to be sending that to, to all member governments. We intend also to follow up with up to three member governments. So not, so not everyone will get a, a focused interview. Um, but, but based on responses to the online survey, um, I think we're going to try to to make a concerted effort to to follow up with some folks. And then um, the the other big piece of um, our, our ask is these focus group meetings, and it kind of remains to be determined exactly what those are going to look like. But it, it won't it won't necessarily be everybody. 
Um, but we do want to get a good representation from the region um, to discuss and develop and communicate expectations for um, the regional street typology. And then finally, of course, we, we want your, your help in um, reviewing the, deliver, the deliverables and ultimately the final toolkit, which kind of includes everything that we've talked about so far. Um, and and we'll, we'll leave that up to, to you to decide um, how much time you, you want to you wanna spend. Um, but that, that's really that's really our ask of you, and um, and we're we're going to follow up uh, on on these items uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, there is just quickly, there's a question in the chat box about the presentation being available. It will be available. Um, looks like uh, looks like either Beth or Emily had already responded. So yep, that will be available. Thank you for the question. Um, I'm just going to pause really quickly here. Uh, if anyone ha has any questions, feel free to to um, put them in the chat box. We're about to dive into just the, the basic principles um, of complete streets, so we're all understanding what complete streets are. Um, uh, but we'd be glad to answer any questions. Um, uh, but before that happens, um, so we'll keep an eye on on the chat box. But we'll we'll proceed here. Um, so let's let's talk about complete streets. You know, it's it's funny with complete streets because it's it's a term that is fairly new, right? So it it came about in 2003. The National Complete Streets Coalition wasn't a thing until 2005, and and now the now when we talk about complete streets, it, it feels like we have a pretty common understanding. But but I did just want to mention. Um, uh, uh, I just I wanted to get us all on the same page here, and and so so just just to start a big piece of complete streets a big element um is the process right how do you actually get to uh design you know designing constructing and um and maintaining complete streets how do you actually get there how do you you know who are the decision makers what are the uh, the review and approval processes what are the exception processes um it that that's the the way we actually get complete streets done is a huge piece of of complete streets um, complete streets are reasonable accommodations for existing and potential modes and users. For for decades, um, we've sort of been operating under this like, uh, hey, we're just going to look at um, who's using the street today, and that should dictate what the street should look like. Um, but but complete streets really should um, connect to each community's goals uh, from uh, you know an air quality, water quality perspective, from a mode shift perspective, from a safety perspective. Um, we should design for for what we want to see, and then the the third piece here, and there's really a lot more. This is just a sample of what they what complete complete streets are and aren't. Um, but the the third piece is that they they should vary based on context and function, right? Um, a, a street um, in in a a smaller community um, in in downtown is not going to look like a a downtown street in a in a larger more urban context. Um, I, I do want to mention that complete streets are, are not a lot of things, um, but but one thing that they're well, four things that they're not um, are uh, they're not necessarily a bike lane on, on every street. Complete streets need to be um, planned and designed and constructed from a from a network perspective. Not every street is going to have every single thing. Um, they're not just aesthetic enhancements. Certainly, aesthetic en enhancements can um, uh, improve the experience of, of people walking and rolling and bicycling and taking transit and driving along a street, but but it's not just that, right? Um, where we're also thinking about geometry and signal operations and, and space allocation. Complete streets are not necessarily prescriptive designs. Um, that's that's why there's a toolkit, right? So so with the toolkit, you can decide what is the what is the best tool to get the job done. Um, it's not it's not an instruction manual. It's 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 a it's a toolbox, a toolkit. And they're not necessarily more expensive. So we'll we're going to talk a lot more about this um, later on in the development of this project. But uh, we'll 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 want to communicate and and um, get a, a shared understanding of of how complete trees can be implemented um, without uh, breaking the bank. So on the next slide. Um, really what we're expecting for the regional complete streets um, toolkit is is to aid in implementation um, where we're hoping that it'll ultimately yield a network of complete streets across the region um, that are consistent um, and cohesive 
we want to, as, as Beth mentioned earlier, um, use the toolkit as another way to encourage collaboration and, and transparency between um, member governments and, and partner agencies. Um, and, and then we really want to push forward um, local and regional goals. Uh, I, I, you know, everything from the economy to public health um, to uh, community character, vision zero, safety, all of those things, um, complete streets are a, a part of uh, making those happen. So on the next slide, uh, just, just really quickly establishing what the core principles are for complete streets. Um, they need to be safe, right? They, they need to feel um, and be safe and comfortable um, for all robo users, not, not just drivers. They need to be inclusive and equitable. Um, more than ever, we're, we're realizing that, that streets um, need to serve everyone, um, regardless of, of their, their race or background or age. Um, they need to be context sensitive. Uh, they, they, the streets need to match um, the surrounding land use or the um, uh, the future uh, land use or what is expected to be uh, the land use in the future. Um, they need to be a place, right? Complete streets should um, should be places where people want to dwell, where they want to linger, where they want to enjoy um, the, the public space. And, and we're seeing that a lot more now um, where we're, we're thinking about repurposing some of our streets given the pandemic um, to be more than just mobility thoroughfares, right? Um, they, they can be places where you can eat, they can be places where you can play. Um, and then they, they need to be flexible. Um, in, in our current environment, um, we, we want, we, we want to make sure that the decisions that we're making are um, are resilient, um, that uh, that we can make changes in the future, and that complete streets can can adapt and react to uh, changes that we don't even know about right now, um, moving forward into the future. So, um, what do incomplete streets look like? In contrast to complete streets, what do incomplete streets look like? I'm just going to flash a couple of images here um, on the. On the next slide, you, you kind of know it. You kind of know it when you see um, an incomplete street. And the the first image, um, usually if, if we were in, in person, I would have people just kind of yell out with the, the, the problems that they see with the street. But it's kind of obvious, right? You, you don't have sidewalks. You have a really wide roadway. It looks like that person um, uh, with the umbrella in, in the foreground I mean that that lane, that travel, that turn lane looks like is massive, right? Um, it's a really just oppressive environment for for anyone who isn't driving, and, and probably isn't even really that fun for for people driving. Um, on the next slide, you, you see a little bit more of an urban environment, but um, you know a, a big a big facet of complete streets is what happens um, at the uh, at the intersections. Um, if we can move on to the next slide here, yeah. So, so you can see there, you know, there's a lot of uh, people driving that are trying to make this left turn, but there are also people on bikes trying to get through. It's kind of a mess. No one really knows where uh, where they need to be, where they should be. Um, the the next photo is kind of similar to the the first photo, um, but at an, at an intersection level, where you got this just massive um, arterial, and you've got a pedestrian trying to cross and 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 they're not in the crosswalk, but why aren't they in the crosswalk, right? Do they not feel safe using the crosswalk? Is there not enough time um, for the pedestrian phase for them to get across? And so they're you know they're they're kind of stuck um, trying to sort of fend for themselves. And then uh, the third image is, um, is similar. It's just super uh, super wide, um, lots of travel lanes. Uh, there are marked crosswalks. Um, but they're so long that um, it, it really is not a great place to cross. So, so what do complete streets actually look like? And there, there are lots of good examples. Um, just to not show fa uh, favoritism, we, we, we are including a couple of renderings here. Um, but, I, but I did just want to uh, sort of um, call back to the Denver region's history. So, so on, um, on the next slide, this is an image um, looking down 16th Street from the early 1900s, I believe. And it's vibrant, and there are there's there's uh, the streetcar, and there are people driving. 
um, or I, those might be horse carriages, uh, and there are people walking, and it's it's a place where where you'd want to be. Um, but then from a from a local context, on the next slide, um, a, a local street could be a complete street, right? It could feel like a street where you you, you might have grown up on, where you might have played basketball in the street, you might have played football in the street. It felt safe and comfortable enough um, as as a place where you could actually play in. Um, on the next slide, uh, it, this this one just communicates sort of this like uh, this coherency of street design, right? You, you kind of know based on this um, this rendering where people should be, where where people walking, people biking, people driving, people taking transit, where they should be, um, and and also em emphasizing um, safety and and um, still still having mobility and um, allowing people to to safely travel and, and get to where they're going as a priority, um, but but there's more than than just mobility, right? And so then uh, on, on the last slide here, um, this just communicates a little bit of flexibility, right? So so maybe there there's funding um, for uh, part of a project for something more permanent, like, like a curb separated, uh, a median separated uh, bike lane, but in in the interim, there isn't that funding, and so um, going with something a little bit more quicker build, like flex posts um, or or bollards, might might be a more cost effective solution um, in the in the interim. So then, I, so I want to touch on a few uh, before we get to the the group discussion. Um, I wanted to touch on just a few effective design strategies. There, there are many um, design strategies, and, and we'll discuss many of them um, with you as a group. But the very first one that I want to mention is reducing speeds at intersections um, by using design, and, and not just intersections, but 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 really along um, really along every street, right? So, so this is this is a design principle that um, that is is kind of common sense, right? And and we've all seen those those figures around um, the the likelihood of a pedestrian being hit by by a motor vehicle um, by a, a driver. Uh, the the lower the speeds, um, the the more likely those pedestrians are um, are going to survive that crash. So there are a few easy ways to do this, right? So we've all heard of the, the term um, road diet, but um, we also like to think of it in terms of, of street reconfiguration or right sizing. Um, the, the idea here is, is to um, think about the excess space that you might have on a street um, and, and reconfiguring it so that there's, there's more space for, for more people and more users. Um, we're going to talk a lot about uh, curb radii and how there, there's a significant, there can be a significant difference between the actual curb radius um, and then the effective curb radius. This is probably not anything new to, to anyone, but it's something that we, that we need to think about. Um, one way to reduce the curb radii, which is that being applied, um, being this strategy is being utilized across the country and, in, and starting to be utilized in the Denver region, um, but but one way is to um, consider basically a hardened center line with the with the speed bump, and the idea is to to reduce the likelihood that a driver can uh, cut the corner. Um, so that's what's being shown on the left side here on this slide. Uh, on the on the right side, um, this is shortening the uh, the crossing distance and and just making that that exposure space um, much more confined, right? So it. So pedestrians are um, are out of that exposure space um, quicker, uh, and they also have a greater expectation, a greater understanding of where drivers are going to be. Uh, the second design strategy that I wanted to mention is um, sort of it, it's a design strategy, but also an, an operational and a, and a planning strategy. But it's it's planning and, and designing for um, scooters and and uh, bike share and um, transportation network companies like Uber and Lyft and um, connected and on automated vehicles. We're, we're moving into a, and we, we have been for a while now, uh, moving into um, a, a moment in time where uh, how you get around is very, very diverse, right? Um, there are people that are using um, vehicles, motorized or not, that that we haven't seen, um, that we hadn't seen a decade before. And um, in order for us to really be successful with our, our transportation networks, we, we need to make sure to, to accommodate them, encourage them, 
um, especially when we're thinking about reducing uh, the number of, um, of single occupancy vehicle trips. And then the, the third uh, design strategy, uh, and, and the last one, at least for, for this conversation, is to think about the curbside space. The expectations, um, especially given what I've mentioned, uh, the expectations for curbside space, it's, 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 a, it's a battleground. You know, everyone, everyone needs the curbside lane. They want that space, whether it be for uh, transit, whether it be for uh, on-street parking, whether it's for um, Uber and Lyft pick up and drop off, Maybe there's uh, there's a really great expectation for um, separate bike lanes. Maybe it's parklets or out, outdoor dining. Um, it could be uh, freight loading and, and, and unloading. Um, so so th there's a lot of ways that the curbside lane can be used. Um, and so we just need to be really thoughtful. And we hope to provide a lot of guidance here through this effort um, to, to uh, inspire and to point to um, different uses or, or maybe uses contrasting on-street parking uh, for, for the curbside space. So I'm gonna pause there for just a, a second. And um, I, I know we went through a lot, but uh, if you do have any questions or comments, feel free to, to add them to the, the chat box. Um, in, in just a, a second, I'm gonna hand it off to Jessica and she is going to just lead us through some uh, some group discussion questions. Trung, let's go ahead and answer a couple of the questions that are in the question box. Does that sound good? That sounds great. Um, I don't see any on, on my end. Are you seeing any? Yeah, yeah, I'll read them all. Okay, perfect. Um, Alex asked, um, do you have a fire department rep involved? Um, that's a little bit of a tricky question since we don't necessarily have a regional fire department rep. I'm not sure exactly how we would do that um, since we're going to have, and I'll kind of explain that in the last slide of how we're going to um, organize the stakeholder or steering committee. Um, if there is a regional fire department rep that um, someone could think of, we'd be happy to add them, but I don't know how we would have a, a specific fire department rep for each local jurisdiction. Um, next question, will you be developing a map for the entire region with categories of complete streets or just provide the typology? Trung, do you want to take that one? Yeah, so, so our, our intent is to, to work with you um, to develop a, a regional map. Um, and it's, it's going to be, um, uh, we're, there are going to be several iterations of it, but the, the ultimate deliverable will be a GIS data set. Um, uh, for the region. Um, next question, how are you accommodating large trucks? Do you so want to take that one? Yeah, I'll, I'll be glad to. So it's really, it's really going to depend on the context, right? So, so we'll get into a conversation, I'm sure, about um, design vehicles versus control vehicles. Design vehicles is what you should design to, and then control vehicles are are the, the vehicle type that needs to be able to physically make it through an intersection. And so that, of course, that's gonna vary um, depending on the jurisdiction and the context and, and the street type. Um, so, so you know, if, if there's gonna be like a, let's call it like a commercial arterial, um, and we know that there needs to be a lot of, um, there needs to be an accommodation for large vehicles to turn into and out of um, properties, that's that will definitely be um, something that we talk about. But it, but if it's a sort of like a local to local intersection, then there's going to be less need to accommodate larger vehicles. But yeah, that's going to be a, a big part of the conversation. Okay, this is from Sarah Grant from Booth Broomfield. Um, regarding reducing curb radiar, our community must defer to North Metro Fire District standards. Can we engage fire districts in the process and get their buy-in? and support to update their standards. And again, I'll, I'll take that and feel free to engage your fire department throughout the throughout the process. But again, we're going to kind of have to put that on local jurisdictions just because we're going to have one seat for um, each each person on the steering committee. And, and I do want to mention too that this this is intended to be a toolkit, right? So it's not prescriptive. We're not 
we're not laying out a, a, a plan um, for how every curb, every corner, and every street is you know has to look. Rather, it is intended to um, be a resource. And so, so those those conversations, um, we, we'd be glad to to provide resources and, and guidance for those. Um, but but yeah, uh, there there will have to be individual conversations at the at the local level. One second, going through these. How does Dr. Hug plan to incent local govs to implement the tools within the toolkit? And CDOT. You want to take that one, Trung? Uh, can you repeat the question? Was it was it incentivizing complete streets design? Yes, local govs to implement tools within the, within the toolkit. Yeah, so um, Beth, correct me if I say anything um, off base here, but uh, I, I think the intent is ultimately this is going to be integrated into MetroVision, right? So, so the idea is that um, uh, ultimately it it could find you know com uh, complete streets scoring criteria might make it into Dr. Cog's um, project scoring process, and so projects with um, a greater emphasis on complete streets uh, could and would score better, um, and and then and then also uh, you know we're we're kind of we're kind of hoping that um, this project will uh, generate a lot of conversations across member governments, and so so uh, rather than feeling like it's you know uh, it's it's a burden, um, instead it, it's an opportunity, um, and complete streets have been proven to. Uh, really help communities advance uh, make and make progress on their community goals. Okay, we have a couple more in here. A, a lot of them are more of comments that maybe will come up during the group discussion. Do you want to go ahead and get started on that, Trent? Yeah, you want to jump into group discussion? Sure. All right. Uh, Jessica, take it away. Yeah, thanks. Um, so, so it's actually been really great to hear some of those initial questions because uh, I, I imagine we'll hear uh, some similar themes and the group discussion we're going to have. But yeah, we wanted to take this opportunity at this first meeting to, of course, hear from you all and um, just just get an initial understanding of what some of the sort of challenges um, uh, that you're facing are, but also what some of your successes are. Um, I think it's really it's helpful for us to hear that because, um, as you all know, there's quite a diversity of contexts in, and practices in the region. Um, and this toolkit is absolutely going to apply to everyone. And so um, that means we need to um, do our homework, right, and hear from you all and have you actively engaged. Uh, so what we'd like, so I'm going to go to the first question, if you could go to the next slide. Um, Trung mentioned this in the beginning. Um, but I'll say it again, uh, if you would like to respond, and we highly encourage you to do so, um, please uh, use the raise, raise hand function of GoToWebinar, and then uh, one of the organizers will unmute you so you can give a response. Um, and highly encourage you to turn your video on if that works. I'm not totally sure it will. If it doesn't, that's okay too. Um, but uh, that would be nice, um, so we could at least try to simulate that we are in person. Um, so, so to start, um, this first question uh, is, uh, we would love to hear, ideally from everybody, uh, about a recent uh, or ongoing Complete Streets project that you're proud of um, and why you're proud of it. Um, obviously, um, keep your answer relatively brief and high level. Um, but if we could hear from you all about this, it'll give us a really good sense of, you know, some of the great efforts already going on in the region. So who wants to go first? Is the, is anyone having issues with the raise hand function? I'm assuming that's all working okay. I do not see anyone with their hand raised as of yet. Okay. Well, we we know that you all have a lot to say on this one. So I'll just give you another minute. 
or so. Um, Guy Norris from Eaglewood. Yeah, I guess I'll raise my hands if someone else did. Uh, so uh, this is before my time, but Inglewood Ingle, uh, is actually has its own complete street toolkit that it, it created. And since I've come here, um, we've actually got an eight step funding for a, uh, a traffic common corridor. So we're going to be starting that and we'll, you know, lean to the complete street toolkit, uh, our own one and other uh, guidance as we do this. It's going to be uh, a lot of curb extensions uh, and many roundabouts. And, but we'll also look at, you know, other elements uh, of, of, of like a, a complete street toolkits as we design this project. That's fantastic. Yeah. We are looking at a number of other projects that will employ a uh, strategy, including hopefully in the future a, a larger uh, complete street project in our in our hospital district. All right, great to know. Thank you. Who wants to go next? So uh, I guess if no one else wants to raise their hand, um, we could take this opportunity to go to the I next question. Sorry, um, Alexander Phillips from um, Boulder. Okay. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me now? I can, yes. Okay. Um, so the reason I wanted to talk about one of our projects or two of our projects really is just because I, I'm also curious to see if this kind of thing will be handled in the toolkit. Um, one is on uh, J Road, unincorporated in Boulder County, and we were able to add um, a buffered bike lane on that road and also green striping, um, skip striping through the intersections. It's a road with very low, it's unincorporated, higher speeds, no sidewalks, and we really can't, we'll never be able to put full sidewalks and we're just looking at transit access. We also put in a jug handle turn or a go right to go left for the cyclists accessing a trail mid block. The other one that is not built yet, and I think it's um, starting next year, is on Isabel Road where it crosses 287 and all um, very limited right of way, um, but we were able to put in a, um, two foot buffer and a five foot bike lane just as it's coming up to the intersection to cross 287. And I would love to have more um, toolkit stuff that um, that CDOT would be open to doing or um, in their projects and whatever that, that handles that type of road on Isabel, I think the speed is maybe 50 miles per hour. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that's great. I, I believe we have some folks from CDOT um, on the call. Um, do any of you have a completed uh, project that you'd like to share that you're proud of from a Complete Streets perspective or an ongoing project? Got a couple more local jurisdictions that want to share some projects. Okay, that's great. Um, Daryl for City of Thornton, would you like to go ahead? Uh, yeah, can you hear me okay? Yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, yeah, uh, uh, recently we uh, um, reconfigured a section of 112th Avenue. Uh, previously it was, it was wide enough for five lanes. Uh, we use part of that to provide right turn lanes at intersections. Uh, it was an extremely wide street that essentially functioned at a, as a collector. Uh, so we narrow the, narrowed a cross section to three lanes um, and then used the outside to implement on street bike lanes uh, with a buffer. Um, so it turned out to be a fairly nice project. That sounds great. Thanks. And Alex from Superior, if you can 
should be unmuted. Okay, I don't know if you can see me, but um, in Superior, we're building our downtown, downtown Superior. So we've had an opportunity to build a, a complete street at uh, bike lanes and traffic calming built in narrow, narrow lanes, curb extensions, raised crosswalks, a number of, of features. Um, and we're now starting to see some of the issues we have with snow removal, with large trucks trying to negotiate uh, these narrow streets. So we're trying to, we're identifying some of these issues that are coming up. I think our, our town board uh, loves what we've been able to do out there, um, but um, it, it's context sensitive. It's gonna be our downtown with first floor retail and second, third floor uh, residential. Uh, but uh, that's another example of uh, anybody wants to see building a uh, complete street from scratch looks like. That's awesome. Thank you. And yeah, a context like that can be a really good and sort of easier place to start. So. Are there any more, uh, Beth? Yeah, any more I'm questions? From Denver. You should you should be able to talk now if you unmute yourself. This is Eileen Yazzie. Were you calling on me? Sorry. Yes. <laughs> oh, great. Oh, um, just wanted to share, um, I would say, our complete street journey on 15th um, Street in downtown Denver. Um, we actually have, uh, an, in part of our planning teams group chat via Teams, this last week, one of our teammates, he posted pictures from 2013-14. And then as of today, in 2013, it was, I believe, um, three or four lanes of uh, vehicle traffic movements, and then it was uh, parking on both sides. 2014, we added in kind of a, a first, I would say, phase of our protected bike lane. And then um, in 2000, earlier this year, we upgraded that protected bike lane and added in some additional protection. And then we did a bus only lane um, two. Uh, so there's two lanes of, tra of uh, vehicle traffic. There's a bus only lane. This has um, just a high, high number of buses. We are able to save minutes off of people's commute just in this small section of downtown. And then our protected bike lane is just pretty awesome to ride. So that's been a, a journey of a complete street for um, about six or seven years, but happy in the current state it is. And I think that also uh, a nod to Jessica um, and the tool team here that are helping us out. They've just also helped um, Denver uh, do its final draft of its complete street guidelines. Um, and these will essentially be, we will use these guidelines to modify our specs and details. And those are actually on Denver's website out for public comment. So if anyone's has time uh, and needs to get to bed and needs a, a book to read or a guideline to read, please feel free to Google it. Um, if you even just Google Denver Complete Streets, it should pop up on our website. Yeah, good uh, good plug for that. And, uh, and Eileen, thanks for that example of 15th Street. Um, I imagine that in um, this toolkit, we will discuss, you know, that sort of adaptability of, of complete streets over time and the iterative, iterative, iterative nature that they can have. Um, because we, we see cities really across the country doing some similar things, you know, really um, evaluating how something's working and, you know, trying something different or trying something a little bit better. Uh, trends in street design uh, change um, relatively rapidly, I'm sure, as you all know. And so we want to make sure that this toolkit really responds to that and includes some of those um, kind of future considerations. All right. Great. Thank you. One more. Uh, Steve Durian from Jeffco you should be able to talk now. Yeah, uh, in Jefferson County, well, as you know, uh, a lot of the examples we're hearing are more in urban context. In Jefferson County, we have a a large cycling uh, community because uh, we're right on the edge of the metro area and the first um, you know steep canyons you get to are in Jefferson County so we get a lot of demand for uh, bike shoulders in those areas and some of those areas are just simply too narrow to widen 
uh, or the environmental impact would be great by you know tearing down a canyon wall or something like that. So we found that uh, in many cases we can, instead of trying to achieve a full template of uh, shoulders on both sides of the road or bike lanes on both sides of the road, it's sometimes possible to just climbing lanes or climbing shoulders on the climbing side. And then if you've got it up and down, you can transition that from one uh, side of the road to the other in some cases and have those downhill cyclists take the full lane. Uh, we've implemented this solution uh, recently on County Road 93, which connects Morrison to Golden. We also have a fairly unique situation on Dinosaur Ridge. If you've been there recently, you'll notice that we've restriped bike lanes. Uh, there we don't have general public tra vehicle traffic, but we do have tour buses that go up the road. We also have a lot of pedestrians checking out the fossils. So trying to separate all those uses can be tricky, but we've implemented a, a striping plan there that I think is uh, a little unique and has been negotiated with the bike community and the friends of Dinosaur Ridge. So if you get out and if you're cycling around and you want to check out those sites, uh, you can kind of see what we've been trying to do in Jefferson County. Well, thank you, Steve. I love I love the contrast between the two examples, between Eileen, Eileen's example and your examples. Uh, that really shows the diversity of the context in the region. And, um, and yeah, we, um, as Chong mentioned a lot in, in his material, you know, the, the treatments and the approaches that this toolkit were, will include will be pretty specific to different contexts. And so you gave us some good examples of some things that are that you've done successfully. So thank you. I think that's all the hands raised. Do you want to move on to yeah. the next question? Let's go to the next one. Uh, so what um, some of you have started to touch upon this uh, and in what you just said, um, but uh, we'd love to hear from uh, more people or, or the people who, who've already spoken. If you, you have more to say on this particular aspect, but what are some of your biggest challenges with implementing complete streets? Um, we've e even in the the comments and questions that Beth read off initially, um, and this is no surprise because this is one of our biggest challenges on every one of these projects. Um, a lot of people brought up emergency access, um, you know, fi fire department, um, you know, just navigability and um, and just kind of large vehicles in general. Um, so I would expect that to come up again and again, um, and, and we totally appreciate that um, consideration. Um, but what else, or if anyone wants to kind of expand on that, um, what are some of the challenges that you have faced in your communities? Hello, you know, this is some... Deborah Basket. Hello, this is Deborah Basket from the City of Westminster, and I wanted to share that one of the challenges we face is we. We, we really have been focusing on uh, retrofit, retrofitting existing streets that were built for a different age. And sometimes we're doing that by narrowing lanes in order to add a bike lane or a buffered bike lane. Um, on a, one occasion last year, we eliminated a free right turn in order to make those accommodations. So the challenges we faced are community members First, pushing back on any change because it freaks them out that there's a change. And secondly, having any perception or reality that their um, motor vehicle trip is delayed uh, in order to accommodate other modes. Um, we found that dies down after a while and we have anticipated it as we've gone into new projects and really taken an even closer look at should we eliminate that right turn or how should we stripe it? So that's what I had to share. That's a great example. Thanks, Deborah. Christina, did you want to add to what Deborah was saying? Yeah, uh, Deborah, Deborah punched in before me. I was just going to add a little bit in addition to that. Um, now, I've only been with Westminster for a little over a year, so there's some history before me. But the concept of let's widen roads and let's just look at vehicles it's starting to need to change now, even though we're in a very suburban vehicle centric, quite a bit of our jurisdiction in Westminster. We are doing our first transportation mobility plan where we are starting to have the complete streets conversation with the public and those trade-off conversations. 
And so we're sending out a survey in the next next month or so that has some trade-off sliders of what's more important, a little vehicle delay or the safety of a movement of all modes. And so that's something that with this toolkit could even help us more to have the conversations both internally as staff with our council members and the public about the trade-offs of the right-of-way, the use of it, and if we choose to widen the road, what kind of complete streets lens we can put on there with some kind of policy. So that's where we're at too. Well, that's great to know that you've, you're having those community conversations now. Um, so yeah, we will definitely want to get more of that information from you and, and see how this effort can complement it. Great. Um, Shane Roberts from Littleton, you should be unmuted now. Okay. Um, I think one of our challenges is just the term complete streets. Uh, we tried to put a complete street section in our recent TMP and we were told that the term was too politically charged. So we changed it to complete network, um, but it has all the complete street stuff. Um, and we've done a few projects with some temporary measures, you know, tough curb and flex posts. And we've had pretty good success with the, with the data we've collected there. Um, but when we try to go into some of our uh, upper scale neighborhoods and, and propose some solutions with flex post and tough curb, they, there's a lot of pushback because uh, it doesn't match the character of the area and there's not a kind of long-term funding plan for putting in something that's more permanent, so. Thanks for sharing that, Shane. That's, yeah, those are, those are some uh, comments we've heard from others as well. That's really interesting about the terminology. Um, it is sort of, uh, Yes, it's an imperfect term, isn't it? Um, and you know, my I feel like in my ideal world, there will be a time when we won't even have to call it complete streets because it will just be the way we design streets, right? But until then, uh, we have a special term for it in our industry. Um, and I think that really emphasizing the network piece of it, you know, as Chung mentioned earlier, uh, I think is going to be important for this effort as well. Um, Chessie Brady should be able to talk now. Hi, this is Chessie Brady with RTD. And as the our buses are taking up space on the streets, and certainly we can benefit from bus-only lanes and such, but we are often a challenge to you, you jurisdictions implementing um, complete streets. And I, I just wanted to say I really liked um, the phrasing in the earlier presentation about um, control vehicles and how um, working, I, I look forward to seeing more detail on how you can make streets that work for people and then, but also I'll still allow the buses to go through because that's that's just something we deal with. And as a, as a planner, I want those curb extensions, but I know that our buses can't get around them. Um, and so it's, it's something, um, the, the more ideas we can bring to those discussions, the better. Thank you. Yeah, it's a, critical consideration on um, the movement and transit. So we definitely will note that. Um, Deborah, I see your hands raised again. Was that raised from before or do you have something else to add? I do have something else to add. So I put something in the chat box earlier. Um, some of you have heard me say this before because in the very beginning discussion about urban arterials and urban safety, um, this the terminology about right sizing and road diet was used, and it was earlier today. And I find those words to not resonate with the community. Um, so I challenge us in the industry to figure out better words. This is the first time I had heard that traffic that complete streets were something that the community might not be comfortable with. So I encourage us to even make it more generic, safety improvements, traffic calming, something, things with positive connotations. I think that we're the ones that are gonna coin the phrase. So um, I challenge us to do that. That's a great point. Um, Steve Durian from Jeff Co, do you have something to add? Uh, yes, uh, you know, it was brought up earlier about fire departments, and I maybe wanted to expand on my experiences with fire departments and why that's such a, a challenge for complete streets. Um, whenever you want to narrow streets, so I, I used to work for the city of Boulder, and when I worked at Boulder, we uh, created uh, residential street standards that were narrower and probably would 
be considered much narrower than many jurisdictions would allow. And if you go up the Dakota Ridge area of City of Boulder, uh, you'll see some of those streets in place. Uh, when I got to Jeffco, uh, I, you know, we've got pretty standard suburban streets, I think, and maybe a little wider than some, certainly someone from Denver, uh, working for Denver might consider adequate. Um, and still we get, especially from one of our fire, one of our large fire districts, we get pressure to make those templates wider. And because they're getting larger equipment and, uh, you know, the standard, the state of the art for the fire districts and fire departments is wider and bigger equipment. And so it's real, it's a real challenge. And it's just, it, it blows my mind that we're going the wrong direction on the issue of narrower streets. The fire departments are pushing us for wider streets. And it, it's just uh, something that I think our industry and the fire departments need to come to terms on and somehow find a solution. And I know that uh, the statements here, are, well, we should work with our local fire departments and districts. And Jeffco, we have several fire districts and it's just, it's it, it's an ongoing issue and they all use the same uh, fire code. They change their standards a bit, but it's all based roughly on the fire code, the international fire code. And, and so I, I hope that that can somehow, um, that, that relationship can somehow be improved and we can achieve what we want to do in context of the fire code, the fire districts and fire departments. Yes, uh, yes to everything you said, Steve. It's, uh, we. We uh, appreciate the mention of um, the fleet, you know, the actual fleet size, um, the, the vehicle size, um, and some of those trends. Uh, we've seen that as well. Um, and I think the more, the more sort of awareness um, that collectively as a group we have, um, and as we have those conversations at, you know, the municipal and, and county and regional levels, um, the better, just because sometimes I think that connection is not made between uh, street design and vehicle size um, from other departments. So that's a really good consideration. Looks like we have one more hand raised. Um, Kevin Spencer from the city of Denver. Yes, hi. Can you hear me fine? Yeah. 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 Uh, I've been hearing this talk about like uh, fire trucks. Um, with curb returns. So I don't know if any of you else attended that CDOT's bike facility and ped facility training course. I believe it was held earlier this year. It seems forever ago by now. Um, but they were kind of saying with the tightening up of the curb returns, they suggested like you then kind of build at the curb return like a truck apron to so you're like, you know, it's just a way of still making the intersection smaller for PEDs, designing for the most vulnerable, but accommodating an occasional large vehicle like a fire truck. So I don't know if you guys are aware of that, but that was just an idea I learned from C Dots course. Yeah, that's that is a great tool. Um definitely um, one of the, the tools we would imagine being included in this toolkit. Um, and, and I know um, city and county of Denver is you know, starting to use that treatment and, and maybe some others on this call are starting to use that treatment. But yeah, that can really um, offer um, kind of benefits to both ends of the spectrum, if you will, um, as, as you're indicating, um, to really try to try to slow turns for most vehicles while making them possible for the very infrequent but necessary vehicles. Correct, yeah. Guy, you should be unmuted. Oh, did you uh, just call on me? Yes. Yeah, so a couple of things is I do think the uh, so far, I haven't had too much difficult uh, on with fire departments when I've been doing stuff like this, but I definitely think it's a real concern. And I would suggest that, like maybe a fo there needs to there should be like a focus section, a uh, session for uh, uh, not all the fire departments, but a uh, a gathering of different fire departments in the region. Uh, so I do think that's a big issue, uh, and. Uh, then I also just kind of thought on the, uh, I do think it's really confusing because what to call something, because I'm working on everything from a bike boulevard to a tra my mini traffic common corridor to what I'm calling neighbor a neighborhood way, 
where uh, it, you know, it's kind of a, a traffic common thing with like uh, curb extensions and um, and uh, and some uh, some traffic circles at the turn all the way stops. Uh, but that is kind of an issue: is what is what? What's a complete street? What's a neighborhood bikeway? What's a bike boulevard? What's uh, uh, what's what's the other word? There's a new word I just recently saw. Uh, neighborhood street. Yeah, that's even a terminology. So I do think that's kind of an issue. Uh, and there's a lot of overlap there. Um, and then like I, it's kind of funny so far with my. Uh, I've just gotten my uh, my traffic calming corridor out there to the public, you know, uh, reach it out. And I, so far, it's funny. I've actually their their concern is we're removing the signals that have a lot of non-compliance. And the comments I've gotten so far from uh, direct directly is, how does it make it safer to not have signals? And actually, what really resonated well with, with a citizen this week was, uh, we're pulling them off of autopilot. Because when I try to explain traffic common, like how it's actually okay that it's uh, uh, tended to be a little more difficult. That it, but the, the idea of pulling people out of autopilot really was uh, seems to resonate well. That that it is. I mean, uh, by by adding these features instead of instead of you know, uh, so I just kind of as a comment there as well. Thanks, Guy. Yeah, that's those are some really good points and thoughts. I appreciate it. Hey, Brenda, do you have one more thing to add before we move on to the next question? Sorry, not many many to dominate all, but there there's some really cool stuff that Westminster's learned over the years. So a number of years ago, some of you might have read a case study about our Bradburn development that uh, was a from scratch redo development that was able to have really skinny streets and the fire department was hugely concerned. So our fire department, our fire chief in particular, was enrolled in the team of elect officials and the planning director and community development director that traveled to a few places in the nations to observe what had happened. And this is more than a decade ago. And as a result, the bridges that were built were astonishing in terms of seeing things through the fire department's eyes. So, so what I learned later on coming to Westminster from our fire chief um, were things like, for one thing, they're not opposed to choosing other equipment if it's appropriate and budget allows. So there are smaller fire trucks, but it also so much depends on where the actual fire trucks are serving. So for example, in our downtown Westminster area, which is very much a new urbanist design with skinnier complete streets for lack of a better term right now. Um, what the fire department explained to us is if they are, if they are fighting a fire with a building that's four or five stories tall, they need a landing area to set the truck. That's very different than saying the whole street has to be X width. So just really digging down a little deeper and enrolling the fire departments in the particular things you're trying to do. There may be some accommodations um, and learning together that can be a win-win situation. Thank you. Yeah, that's a that's a really good point, Deborah. Um, you know, we we've found that as well. You know, once you actually have the direct coordination, um, whether or not it's you know with the fire department or another department that may have just different um, needs than than the streets department might have. Um, you know, I think really understanding where they're coming from and and how they operate is key. Because yeah, if you actually get into the details, you can. You can certainly find some compromises, um, and so I know a lot of a lot of cities we've worked with have had have been able to make headway as well. So I appreciate that success. Uh, so Beth, do you want to move on to the the next slide, which um, is related to this conversation we've been having, of course, um, but just a little bit um more we'd love to hear from you about um you know kind of with all this in mind um what what do you really want to see come out of this complete streets toolkit um you know we've already we've already heard many things in terms of some of the the 
um, nuance and context you're looking for, um, and, you know, really kind of considering a variety of treatments that um, can kind of like walk this line between, um, of course, being safe, being navigable, um, not being unattractive. Um, we've definitely heard that, uh, as well as a number of other things that have been said. So what else? Um, what are the other things that, that that would make this end product really useful for you in your city? Fair, a grant from Broomfield. Did you have something to add? Yes, thank you, Beth. Um, I, I think my comment probably will, will feed into um, the question that you're asking right now, but I do appreciate all the previous comments about uh, you know, fire access and emergency access, and I appreciate Deborah's um, insights for very specific questions. But I think that you know, when it comes to standards, so for example, in a st complete streets toolkit, um, reducing radii, um, especially in neighborhoods, um, what we're facing with, with our fire district is that they have um, a, a minimum uh, standard of, I believe it's 25 feet. And I think that it would be really helpful if there is a way to engage, as someone had mentioned previously, a focus group, especially for communities that are facing challenges with emergency access, you know, bringing those communities together with these districts to talk about how we we find solutions to, um, you know, revise our standards. Our Broomfield standards would go for a much smaller radius in neighborhoods, but North Metro wouldn't allow that. So I think it would be very helpful. And I think speaking as a region and collectively, I think we'll get a lot farther than trying to individually engage our districts. So I just wanted to throw that on the table. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Paul from RTV. Yeah, so um, one thing I have been just incredibly impressed with uh, during the COVID pandemic is the ability for certain local governments to quickly mobilize quick builds to close streets or uh, do things to better accommodate pedestrians in the right of way. And I wonder, particularly as local governments enter, uh, well, any government really at this point, enter into a more financially constrained environment if there's an opportunity in this toolkit to discuss phasing of implementation of, of complete streets and particularly with a focus on piloting just because i think that um, as a lot of folks in this call have experience with that is typically a softer way if you will to implement any type of a potentially progressive or controversial idea. Um, so, so potentially, you know, thinking about how a complete street could be implemented on a temporary basis um, and then, you know, kind of built upon in the future to make it more permanent, you know, assuming some level of success. So um, just, just a thought in terms of how uh, the, the, the implementation or some of the tools that are being developed can be implemented in a phased approach and potentially less financially um, significant. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, that's a really practical suggestion. Uh, Kit Mormon. Yes, uh, this is Kit Mormon, City of Thornton. Um, one of the things that I would like to see come out of this is not just for local streets, but also arterial streets and um, that sort of thing. Um, you know, we've slowly implemented uh, some complete streets on our arterials and did receive some pushback, not from the fire, but from our trash truck operators because we narrowed the lanes down and they had to drive more alert but we also slowed traffic down but the by by having some standards for different arterials and and collectors and even the local streets i think would be good one of the things i would like to caution us on is calling a uh, an arterial a neighborhood street or um it, it might be a neighborhood area but if we call it a neighborhood street i think that that will be used against us uh, when we're before council trying to do something if it's labeled a neighborhood street when in 
actuality it to move traffic, um, whether it be transit, bicycle, pedestrian, or or car. Uh, so we need to be cautious on how we label these in the future um, as we develop the network. That's all I have. Thanks, Kent. Yeah, we uh, we will definitely be working with all of you, as Trung mentioned, um, to to really come up with those names and to not only the names, but like um, what's considered in those names. You know, what are what are the sort of groupings of qualities that these different types of street should streets should have? Um, so yeah, we would we would imagine arterial streets would would certainly have a different type of name than. In neighborhood street as well um, but yeah whether or not you know there's a lot of variation and sort of that um, nomenclature you know some some places really want to keep some element of functional classification included for example whereas some are okay um, not including that and just having um, the streets like connector you know like commercial connector for example um, a street name um, just evoke um, of sort of function, but not specifically be uh, inclusive of a functional classification. So there are a lot of different ways to do it. Um, and, and our team have experience working in a lot of different places who've done it differently. So yeah, we're gonna be coordinating with you um, really quite a lot over the next um, basically two months, um, six weeks to two months on that. That's actually a pretty, one of our very first and um, most intensive tasks will be to develop that street typology with you all. So stay tuned for that. Thank you. Deborah, if you want to go ahead and talk. Nope. Sorry. That was a boo boo. <laughs> also learn. <laughs> uh, Guy Norris. Yeah, I think this has already been said, but uh, I do think it's important that you know that when the with the toolkit we we think about how that's kind of been said the last uh, in part by the, the last couple of people that uh, uh, that it's not just for what we call a uh, like a, a complete street of a new construction you know a new kind of a rebuilt but you know just that it uh, it will help guide approaches and even just for like overlay projects or that aren't specifically related to uh, safety, you know that where where it where we could seek opportunities. So and and just you know more and I think just the fact that I think leading uh, obviously retrofitted is really important because we don't want to have to wait for our major reconstruction or funding to uh, uh, to do a real uh, to do you know what like a major complete street. So I just when when we uh, when we're putting this toolkit together, I think that's like the expectations that, that the toolkit will be uh, a good multi, you know, multi-use toolkit. It's not just for uh, uh, complete street projects of high funded, but it, for everything from uh, just overlays to uh, lower cost pro uh, projects as well. Yeah, no, that's that's great um to hear that that you're thinking about those different implementation methods thank you lisa nugent you should you should be unmuted if you'd like to speak hi yeah this is lisa Wynn with um denver international airport um and i guess our um our perspective is we have a little bit of a, a, a new opportunity. Um, in particular, a lot of uh, so a lot of Den real estate is working with all of the area that um, the airport owns and is hoping to develop. For example, 61st and Pena, 72nd Himalaya, um, all of these kind of station areas. And uh, there really isn't any existing infrastructure there right now, which presents um, a really kind of new and exciting opportunity, but also something that I think we need to be very mindful of. And one thing that um, I know Hu Lang is on this call as well um, from City of Aurora, we are getting a lot of referrals and development that's happening out by the airport. And so one of the kind of questions and concerns that should be, um, I think, 
considered sooner rather than later is what these street types are. Um, and when we're dealing with a lot of these developers, we're getting your traditional traffic impact studies, you know, TISs. And um, a big question that I'm constantly faced with is what's the capacity? Um, how many lanes should there be? And in particular, when we're looking at some of these districts where we're hoping to make them a little bit more accessible to folks who are walking and biking, um, I think having this toolkit to be able to bridge um, between what comes from a typical traffic impact study, um, being able to kind of connect what capacity and demands are um, with what multimodal um, aspects are, I think that would be really helpful for us. Yeah, thanks, Lisa. Uh, that's that's good to know. Um, and, and certainly uh, what we hear from a lot of uh, cities we work with uh, as well, that sort of like um, where it all actually happens when it's a private development project and how, how you make sure that the complete streets uh, principles and treatments actually um, are required and, and get implemented. And so it, one thing that Trung mentioned in the beginning as he was walking through the scope elements was uh, this complete streets model policy um, that we would be developing. Um, and, and certainly like uh, some of you on this call, um, I'm sure already have a complete streets policy and we'll be actually reaching out to you to ask that very question. Um, but maybe it needs a refresh, right? Um, I think there were a lot of complete streets policies or ordinances um, and maybe the first generation of complete streets years ago um, that maybe weren't, haven't resulted in um, what you wanted them to. Uh, and so, you know, we would encourage you to, to think about that policy link and maybe um, thinking about how your local policies can really specifically reference this toolkit once it's completed. Um, I think that would be great. And then perhaps you want to take it further at the local level level yourselves, depending on, you know, what kinds of investment um, and stakeholder engagement you'd like to have. Great. I don't think I'm seeing any more hands raised. I don't know if you had any closing thoughts, Jessica. If not, I, I can go on to kind of the next steps. Uh, yeah. No, I think uh, this has been this has been really helpful um, for us to get a sense of the kinds of things you're you're facing in your communities um, and what you are hoping to get out of this project. Uh, we're going to be more formally asking you these questions as well in the coming weeks um, as we uh, send out some online surveys and, um, of course, requests for information from you and stuff like that. So, yeah, this will be the start, I think, of a, a very engaged project, um, and we're just really looking forward to working with you all. Thank you, Jessica. Um, real quick, I'm just going to go over some next steps and what to expect um, in the upcoming weeks. Um, so with the change in times and with planning most, if not all of these meetings to be virtual platforms, um, we've decided to do the steering committee a little different and a little larger than previous stakeholder steering committees. Um, we're giving all local jurisdictions one seat or one space on the steering committee. So when we send out the survey, um, we will be sending it out to the larger list that I sent this kickoff meeting to. Um, then the first question of the survey will be asking you to assign a specific person from your local jurisdiction to the committee. And then moving forward, that person will be listed on the steering committee and will receive the rest of the project materials. Um, so if you want to be that person, great. Um, we had great participation today. We're happy to have you on board. Um, but if not, um, maybe be thinking about the most appropriate person you'd like to be participating in this effort. Um, Trung had the slide that had um, all the commitments that we're asking for you. So, so maybe take another look at that and think of if you're the right person, if there is another more appropriate person, um, we're, happy, we're happy to have um, either or um, on board. Um, so again, oops, sorry, um, again, we'll be having that survey come out in the next um, week or two weeks, um, probably probably most likely next week and a half. Um, and then after we get the um, steering committee established, we're going to be inviting member governments to participate in focus interviews and focus group meetings. 
Um, so with that, we're right at the hour. Um, I know there were a lot of questions in there. I hope we got to all, most of them during the group discussion. Um, but if you do have further questions, um, these are mine and Trung's contact. Um, both of us are available and are happy to answer questions um, as they come in or as you get them in the next up, um, upcoming weeks. Thank you everyone so much. We had really good attendance today and we look forward to working with everyone um, in the upcoming year. Thanks everyone. Thank you.